the rising confidence of India under Prime Minister Narendra Modi actually resulted in um, unknowing China. It's important to remember that President Xi Jinping has also got his aspirations. 2035 is laid out that he would like China to be the strongest power in the world, right. to be able to counter any country. That's the time he's going to be 82 years old. That's the, perhaps the last of his Legs of his rule, yeah. And, yeah. and so he may be in a bit of a hurry to get things going. That is something we've got to be worried about. At this particular time, lots and lots of personalities from India seem to have emerged in the international sphere, leading the major companies into in their recovery and things like that. All this has made it, been a very con major contributory factor. But beyond that, I think Indian soft power also to a great extent, which uh, Prime Minister Modi seems to be exploiting to a very, in a very correct way. It's been three years. We've been in eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation along the LSE with China. Your sense about this three-year-long standoff and everybody has their rationales about why it's not ending. What's your rationale? I think the more important question that we have to ask ourselves is why did it happen in April 2020? That may give us the answers as to why is it continuing. I am of the opinion, and I did some very deep introspection and analysis on this, and I'm convinced that uh, the rising confidence of India under Prime Minister Narendra Modi actually resulted in um, unknowing China okay. to a very great extent. Okay. You see, while China was watching India, they knew India is developing, economically is doing well. We could not achieve a 10% or a 14% growth rate, but we were doing well at averaging at 7 to 8 and 9%. Strategically, we were not projecting ourselves. After 2014, first of all, that projection started. The strategic importance of India started emerging and becoming stronger. Jammu and Kashmir started getting resolved. Not resolved, I'll say, but uh, our, uh, our uh, strategy became more effective. 2016 onwards, particularly after the Udi attack, we had Operation All Out. We had um, uh, the response for the surgical strikes and the Balakot strike. And then 2019, the unimaginable, that is the removal of Article 370. I think all this sent home a message that India is on the march, strategically on the march, mm -hmm. and uh, that it needs to be dented. That confidence needs to be dented to pull it back. Because China cannot afford to have India as a serious contender for power in Asia. Mm -hmm. It is always concerned about the maritime zone in the Indian Ocean, particularly. It does not want it, India to join up with America to make it a partner in the Indo-Pacific strategy as such. So, if they wanted to dent our confidence. And they, they, made, they took advantage of the pandemic. Perhaps they prepared for it well before that, but they took advantage of the pandemic. And they came in in April 2020 at a time, maybe they surprised us to some extent. And it's not diluting because the world order is changing. The pandemic has affected the whole world, Absolutely. economically and not strategically. No one expected the Ukraine war to break out. No one expected the Afghan Afghanistan withdrawal to take place. All this has affected the world. And China is not in a situation at the moment to take major decisions, which will sort of show as if it has diluted its stance towards India. Sure. And therefore, I expect that this will continue for some more time. Okay. You said that the major objective was to dent India's rising stature and confidence. That they've not been able to do, have they? Despite engaging us at the LSE for three years now. I think quite the opposite has happened, actually. Right. If you really see into since then, it's not alone in the military field. It's not alone in the diplomatic field. Uh, it's very much in, in, in the economic field. For example, the first year of the pandemic, minus 24% growth, minus 7% and then bounce back to 6.25, 6.35 kind of a growth that we have come to. Now the fastest, rise, the, the fastest growing economy of the world. Other issues like uh, the stature which the Honorable Prime Minister has gained, 
internationally his uh, this messaging to to president putin and the seo uh, summit in august uh, 2022 i mean that made a huge international uh, yeah. difference it to the it reverberated international international throughout the globe yeah, this is not an era of war no it's not an era of war yeah. you see so and uh, then of course the uh, american stance towards india uh, coming in with all those provisions which we were negotiating since 2005 Things like uh, cough, um, um, yeah, le, 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 what is that famous uh, the logistics agreement, LEMOA, okay. um, BICA, and all these agreements which had been being negotiated over a period of time, all of them got signed. It, obviously, America meant business. That India was a trustworthy partner, strategic partner, and this strategic partnership has gone beyond today. So I think to that extent, the Chinese should be regretting what they did in April 2020, and it's, but it's difficult for them to resign now. Because it will show perhaps signs of weakness or prove to the world that they were wrong. So I think they, was, they are going to continue the standoff for fairly long until you find some greater crystallization of the world order taking place. Um, that may happen over the next two to three years. The last point on this is important to remember that President Xi Jinping has also got his aspirations. 2035 is laid out that he would like China to be the strongest power in the world, right. to be able to counter any country. That's the time he's going to be 82 years old. That's the, perhaps the last of his Legs rule. Of his rule yeah. yeah. And so he may be in a bit of a hurry to get things going. That is something we've got to be worried about. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, and you talk about, uh, you know, let's just also talk about Quad. What is your your opinion because you said that uh, China perhaps wants uh, India to remain engaged on the Himalayan side of the uh, uh, frontier and not uh, sort of uh, uh, focus on the maritime importance or, or, or cooperate with the US let's say or the Australia let's say uh, for the Indian Ocean uh, uh, in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, how? But that's also not happening clearly because India is continuing uh, with, with Quad in its corner, uh, India is uh, doing all of that and more. But Indian attention is divided at the moment. What about India's maritime capabilities? Well, India is actually because a that natural is... maritime power. Right. Uh, our trade, I mean, the, we are sitting in the Indian Ocean. We are the crown of the Indian Ocean. Hmm. The ocean is named after India. Yeah, right. right. So we should be very proud of that. And uh, there's no doubt about it that the sea lanes which come out from the Suez Canal, the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, uh, travel south of Sri Lanka and go through the Straits of Malacca onto the South China Sea and reach uh, the East China Sea, the eastern seaboard of China and things like that. These are the sea lanes which have uh, actually come to the assistance of China. Hmm. They have ensured that China's energy has been moving on this. Right. Uh, all the energy traffic, all the finished goods traffic, this has sustained that growth rate of 10-12% average that they achieved over the years. Now, if, if there is a power strong enough to dominate the Indian Ocean and is not a power friendly to China, obviously it's going to worry China hmm. a lot. Hmm. They consider India to be such a power that the roots of the Indian Ocean are a natural area where India can actually put obstacles in the way of, India, of Chinese shipping. So they would prefer us to be concentrating all our security focus on the Himalayas. 3,000 right. kilometers of frontage on top there. That's the place where strike cores, mountain strike cores and things like that are, uh, uh, and those are very expensive things. In fact, if we have three or four um, carrier groups in the Indian Ocean, uh, that would be of great assistance to the United States, to the Japanese Navy. Mm. Uh, the entire Pacific can be then the focus of the United States. And no, India can be given the complete area of the Indian Ocean as mm. far as its maritime zone is concerned. But the Quad is not yet a security uh, apparatus. Alliance, yeah, it's right. Not, it's not it's yet. Not. It is still a more a consultative kind of a platform, a more socio-economic kind of a platform. It will convert to my mind. I think it will have to convert at some time. At the moment, it is AUKUS, which is uh, more the military uh, platform. Alliance. And India is not obviously a part okay. of it. India has, by choice perhaps, uh, refrained from making these kind of, uh, joining these kind of organizations in which it has to show its military footprint because it does not want to send negative messages to China either. 
Remember, I mean, we still have a 120 billion dollar yeah, sure. trade, which is continuing with China. And a very porous border, a long and border porous border. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you talked about Xi Jinping's ambitions and 2035. Um, clearly, he wants to be a bigger player or the major, the biggest player on the global stage. Absolutely. Two events that have happened in the last several uh, weeks, perhaps. One, of course, is the uh, offer to broker peace in the Ukraine war and uh, the Iran-Saudi Arabia accord, the peace deal. Now, that perhaps signals Beijing's geopolitical ambitions more than anything else, these two events. How do you see Beijing's geopolitical ambitions playing out in the short term and in the long term vis-a-vis -vis India? Very interesting. I would, I would, I would term the, both these efforts as a, a manifestation of uh, China's attempts to look a superpower, but actually it's a premature superpower. It's, I would even go to the extent of calling it an immature superpower, mm -hmm. right? Peace, peace is not brokered in this particular manner. For example, let's look at the Saudi-Iran deal, and I've been writing extensively on this. Um, President Xi Jinping visited Riyadh on 15th of December, and the 9th of March, this deal was signed. In three months, less than three months, we had negotiations of a problem which has been manifesting for 1400 years. The Shia Sunni is divide between Iran, which is an ideological divide, a sectarian divide between Saudi and Saudi Arabia and Iran has been going on for 1400 years. So the Chinese must be really super beings if they can resolve an issue like that. Uh, I think it's a very tactical move which has happened just to show itself in very positive light to the maybe the OIC, the Islamic world, the Middle East, which is a very important place for China. That's where the energy is coming from. The Russian energy which comes from the northern routes or which comes from Central Asia is not sufficient to meet the Chinese requirements. It is ultimately from Kuwait, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia. This is the energy which makes the difference here. They have invested in the Suez Development Authority in Egypt because they know that these are the routes through which their finished products have to reach Europe. Mm. Otherwise, the Chinese economy is going to go bust. Right. So the, it, this is a very tactical thing which they have done in showing their presence in the Middle East, which they felt they had not shown sufficiently. And secondly, they felt this was a good opportunity because the Americans seem to have pulled out to a great extent, particularly after the discovery of but shale they gas. But did, did pull out. Yes. yes. There's no doubt after the discovery of shale gas, they have pulled out to a great extent, although we have seen a manifestation under President Trump of the Abraham Accords and um, double IW and things like that. But I think the Chinese probably realized that time had come where they could perhaps make a difference. Mm. And I therefore continue to look at it from a very tactical angle till now. Okay, fair enough. Um, let me just uh, also talk to you about the uh, growing importance of India on the global stage, especially uh, I've been speaking to a bundle of, Ukraine, uh, of uh, people in Ukraine, members of parliament, uh, been speaking to people in Russia and think tanks and think tanks in European Union. Um, all of them seem to feel that, uh, not feel, they now understand, you know, initially in the initial years of the war, uh, initial months of the war, they were like, okay, but why isn't India sort of backing us? You know, it's also democracy and we're fighting for democracy and all of that and, uh, and the rule of international law to prevail. Uh, but now they seem to have understood our point of view. How do you... And since we're talking about India's growing, uh, growing stature globally, a lot of, and a lot of them are looking at India as a, have started looking at India as a credible counter to China, which was not the case earlier. While we kept talking about the Indian tiger, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but it wasn't really happening. And suddenly we are there. Particularly the aspect of India's comprehensive national power. I think the period of cusp from where actually things started really changing uh, is the pandemic. The handling of the pandemic, perhaps to a great extent, I mean a nation of 1.4 billion really? being struck like this and then at the end of it, coming out of it and carrying out an economic recovery, showing to the world that we are virtually the pharma capital of the world, um, the management capital of the world virtually. And then lots and lots, at this particular time, lots and lots of personalities from India seem to have emerged in the international sphere, leading the major countries, major um, um, companies into in their recovery and things like that. All this has made it, been a very contr major contributory factor. 
But beyond that, I think Indian soft power also to a great extent, which uh, Prime Minister Modi seems to be exploiting to a very, in a very correct way. We've got a history behind it. The Indic ideology is there. There's a tremendous uh, aspect of learning here in, in, in the Indian subcontinent, in the civilization. The civilizational aspects are now being brought to light. Yeah. And uh, academically, I think these things are now being rounded up and given a greater stature. The outreach of that to the international community, the international community is perhaps being approached today from an intellectual angle. Earlier, it was uh, the, the approach used to be a child to a parent approach. Right. Now it's a virtually a parent to parent approach that's right. happening. And that is why I think these are the early indicators of why the world is looking at India as a potential counter to China. And they know that the greatest thing about India is its democracy, its uh, uh, capability, civilizational uh, capability overall, and our, our, our particular um, approach towards looking to peace. For example, the, I couldn't find a country which has almost declared that we want to be a $5 trillion economy by 2030 and a $10 trillion economy by 2035. Not many countries declare that. Mm. You may not achieve it, but at least let's try, for, try it. for it. At least try for it. Right. So, as opposed to a child in the room now, in the on the global high table, there's at least a grown-up in the room. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> okay. So, uh, sir, thanks, thanks for talking to us. But I won't let you go before uh, we talk about... Uh, your tenure in the army and uh, you were commissioned in the 4th Bata uh, Battalion, the Garhwal Rifles um, and later commanded the same battalion. Uh, it was a unit which was raised by your father and that story I think we need you to tell our viewers yourself. Uh, uh, you know, in August 1947 viewers at the height of partition uh, there was a uh, there was a marriage that took place, a cross-border marriage that took place. 15th of August was a very, very crucial time for our family. The family was, had not really come into being. When my father was engaged to my mother, to his fiancé, and my mother was from Sofia College, Ajmer. My father was in the army, fighting in, in, in Burma, Indonesia, Bali, and come back from there and suddenly found a partition. He was in Peshawar at that time, bringing his unit from Peshawar to Saharanpur. And my mother's father, who was the principal of the government college at Ajmer, uh, was given an exchange appointment in Peshawar as the principal of the government college Peshawar. Okay. This family, his family was moving to Peshawar and my father was bringing his unit from Peshawar to India. India. And the partition came in the middle. Of course, uh, that's a different story as to how my father took his decision on joining the Indian Army and not the Pakistan Army. But uh, great that he took that decision because then I also joined the Indian Army and we grew up to be one of the most highly decorated families of uh, the Indian Armed Forces. Right. But notwithstanding that, the issue became how would he marry his fiancé. Almost a year passed after partition and there was no way by which he could travel to Pakistan because the war was already going on. Finally, his British commanding officer, to cut it short really, to my, his British commanding officer gave him a letter and sent him to Delhi to meet the general officer commanding of the Delhi area, hmm. General Tara Singh Bal, okay. to whom we owe our family actually. General Tara Singh Bal received my father, met him, saw that he came from an outstanding unit, looked at his personality, saw that he had come from the war, and he said, there's no way that I will not help you. So he started speaking to his friends in the Pakistan army on military circuits, on telephone circuits. And it took him four, five days of speaking, cracking Punjabi jokes and things like that to win them over and convince them that there was an Indian army officer, a Muslim, who needed to go to Pakistan to marry his fiancé who had gone to Pakistan and bring her back. Okay. And he said, this is all unofficial. He doesn't have a movement order. He doesn't have a passport. But I'm sending him in an aircraft. Uh, Tata's Air India has already started functioning at that time. And um, you will not stop him. The Pakistan army assured him. They assured, gave this assurance. And that's how he bought two tickets for my father. And he flew down to Rahul Pindi drove to Peshawar and got married on the 19th of August 1948 mm -hmm. and next morning brought back his bride with uh, two suitcases and a head full of memories and it. she never could meet her family ever again after that. Oh my God. That's because we, a, we being a military yeah. family, you we could, could not, never go back to Pakistan. Oh God. All right. Stage. That's tragic and, and such a 
sweet memory at the same time. Uh, you know, he his father, you know, your father was also known as the Sturi Major um, uh, a, by members of his unit. They, they uh, were, and he also commanded viewers the Garhwal uh, uh, rifles, as I said. So, what do you remember of that? Who He was originally from the 1st Battalion of the Garhwal Rifles. And uh, that was uh, the oldest unit of my of our regiment. Later, he commanded, he raised the 4th Battalion of the Garhwal Rifles, to which I belong also. But while he was in the 1st Battalion Garhwal Rifles, he was known for what is in the army known as a term called olive green attitude, which is nothing could go past him. Everything had to be exactly as per the order and as per the timing. Standing on a parade, if a man moved with a, if a fly went on a man's nose and he tried to swat the fly away, that man was just broken and sent home. It is that kind of a, a policy which you followed. There is no way that you could go against basic military discipline. So he was known as the Sturi Major. What happened during growing up years? You got a taste of that medicine at home? Well, yes, at home, no doubt about it. And even till today, even coming to your studio just now, I made sure I was ready five minutes before the appointed time. <laughs> all right, sir. That's wonderful. That's lovely talking to you. And uh, thank you for sharing all those stories and all those memories. I hope it's been a nice half a wonderful hour conversation. For you. Thank you so uh, much yes, for this. Yes, thank you. Thank you, viewers, for watching this broadcast. We will keep coming back to you with more podcasts. Stay tuned to Hindustan Times.